Hello, welcome to World Civilizations After 1500. Now, this is session three of the fourth topic of the semester titled India in Search of the Divine Reality. All right, so what we're going to be doing in this last session of this topic is to cover part three and part four. Now, part three, we started looking at at the end of session two. It deals with India's classical age. We're going to be looking at a spiritual renaissance, so to speak, uh, also a kind of counterculture revolution uh, that occurred uh, during that time period that gave rise to a series of uh, mystical uh, and spiritual disciplines and schools that became the kind of classical uh, foundation of India, of Indian civilization at the time. After we do that, then we're going to look at the last part. Part four is going to look at India in the Age of Empires. This is going to be the last uh, stage of development of India that experienced uh, major uh, foreign invasions and, and disruptions as well. All right, so let us now turn our attention to our um, outline. Now, it is precisely because now there's a writing system that we're going to see... Uh, a spiritual renaissance taking place uh, during the, uh, the classical age. Um, and this spiritual renaissance was giving rise to a series of spiritual movements, uh, disciplines, mystery schools all over India that were not only innovating new ideas, proposing new ways of looking at reality and how to contact and become one with it, but at the same time, uh, many of those ideas were really going against the culture of the time. Now, this spiritual renaissance was really, in reality, a spiritual or, uh, let us just say, a counterculture revolution. It was going against the grain, against the norms, particularly uh, against the caste system that we talked about in session two, this very rigid social system and structure and that organized people into caste, you know, we talked about that. Uh, and also, it was a revolution against the priestly caste, the Brahmins or the Ramanas, again, uh, because of their uh, grip on the religion. Uh, the religion of Hinduism had become pretty much very rigid, very mechanical, and it was really concentrated uh, in, really, in conducting the proper ritual uh, outwards. In other words, this was something that people were uh, only concerned with, you know, ceremonies and rituals devoted to the gods and performing certain sacrifice, particularly animal sacrifices that were performed to the gods. And they had to be performed in the proper way. The, in the prayers had to be recited in the proper way. Again, it had become so, so rigid in that fashion that uh, it was to a certain degree, devoid of inner spiritual meaning, so to speak, because it was very outward directed, that is to say, directed towards the outside, you know, uh, the ceremonies. So we're going to see uh, an inversion of that, you know, uh, we're going to see a great number of individuals uh, being born at this time that are going to direct people towards a whole different dimension. Instead of directing people towards the outside, uh, the outer world, and conducting ceremonies and prayers and incantations and formulas and sacrifices, instead, people are now offering a new way of experiencing the religion or spirituality, and that is to go inwards, that is to say, to move into this inner world, the inner dimension of, the, of being. And again, we're going to see the birth of new philosophies and new uh, spiritual disciplines. Uh, the ones we're going to cover uh, for uh, this course, for this topic, will be Vedanta, Jainism, Buddhism, and Yoga. And uh, those will be, again, the new expression, so to speak, uh, that will arise that are countering in many cases, the caste system and the power of the priestly caste and offering a whole new perspective of society, what society is, what is the meaning of human existence, and what is the true 
uh, purpose of spirituality. That is to say, is it really outward directed? Is it something that we have to perform outwards you know, in rituals and ceremonies? Or is it something that we have to look inside, you know, inwards, you know, in, in our own being? All right, so let's start with uh, Vedanta. Vedanta uh, can be seen, as we'll see, as the highest expression of this spiritual renaissance. Uh, this is going to be the most sophisticated, the most abstract, so to speak, philosophical and uh, spiritual uh, school or discipline that was born during this time. And the word Vedanta uh, means uh, the end of the Vedas. Let's keep in mind that the Vedas uh, was really the religious and mythical lore of the Aryans that moved into India. We talked about that. And the Vedas were really a series of prayers, incantations, and formulas that people perform in order to carry out rituals. You know, something we mentioned as well. Now, they were considered sacred. The Vedas is a word that means knowledge. Veda, again, means knowledge. Um, and so that knowledge, according to uh, Hindu tradition, was given to humanity by the gods. In other words, this is something that was a revelation, so to speak, a revelation that was given to humanity in order for people to conduct rituals and sacrifices and the like, um, be able to control the, you know, the weather and nature through the forces of the gods and the goddesses and the like, again, empowering human beings, in other words, in the natural world. So it was a very naturalistic uh, religious expression, the Vedas, in other words. Now, Vedanta means the end of the Vedas. Now, Vedanta is not really, again, a philosophy that is canceling the Vedas. It's not saying, well, the Vedas you know, are wrong and we're ending the Vedas. But rather, Vedanta meant that they're now adding a new layer of meaning, a new revelation. This is a new divine dispensation or revelation given to humanity, which is going to finally culminate, you know, human knowledge. This is the culmination of all human endeavor, all human knowledge, and that is knowledge of divine reality. In other words, it's not just the natural world and rituals, but rather what is truly reality as a whole, divine reality. That's the ultimate supreme knowledge that human beings can aspire to and we're destined to tap into and become one with it as well. So you know, one of the reasons why this happened, you know, had to do, of course, with changes taking place in Indian society. You know, societies were growing uh, during the heroic age. And after the heroic age, during the classical age, we see the rise of urbanism. Of course, you know, population is expanding significantly. Uh, we talked about that in session two. And as there's more people, more and more people are going to devote time to intellectual, spiritual pursuits. Okay, And there's going to be uh, a wave of mystics, so to speak. Uh, those were individuals that were really stepping outside, giving up on society and abandoning, in many cases, their cities and towns in search for a higher meaning. Because they were very discontent with uh, Hinduism, you know, the rigid ceremonialism that we talked about. They were very discontent with it. They were not really finding any meaning with it. And so they really just checked out, if you will, of society and they moved into the forest. They became what is called forest hermits. Uh, and in the forest, they're going to pursue a life of contemplation and meditation. Okay, they're trying to uh, look within themselves, you know, the answers to the meaning of existence, what is the purpose of human existence, and what is really uh, the nature of reality, what is really real, in other words. They're really inquiring into that, but instead of inquiring, you know, in terms of uh, conducting uh, scientific uh, research in nature, they're pretty much contacting their own being, in other words. Um, in order to do that. And so this is going to become a trend. This is the kind of counterculture movement that is taking place in India. And this is becoming a trend. 
And more and more we see in India uh, people just moving into the forest. And there's a lot of people following them, by the way. There will be disciples and students that are following people that are attaining a certain degree of understanding, wisdom, illumination, if you will. And they're going to be surrounded by a group of disciples. And they're going to be traveling together from place to place. In many cases, uh, they're asking the population for, um, for food. So this is also going to become a tradition in India that the holy man or the, uh, the hermits, as they were called, the mystics, the sadhus that were called the sadhus as well, uh, they often knocked on people's doors and people, you know, uh, felt that it was their religious duty uh, to confer offerings to them in terms of, you know, serving them drink or food, etc. So they will uh, pursue that path of enlightenment, so to speak. So again, this is going to become a custom and a tradition widespread across India. Um, now, because there's now a writing system, Many of those mystics began writing down their findings as they're contemplating and meditating. They're going to be writing down everything, their visions, for example, their understanding, their wisdom. And all of those writings are now compiled together under a genre not known as the Abnishas. Okay, The Abnishas is really a series of writings and they belong to this Vedantic movement. This is the movement of Vedanta. People in search for the ultimate truth. You know, the end of the Vedas, the, the end of knowledge. What is the culmination of all human knowledge again? It is all contained in the Abnishas. Again, the Abnishas, if you're interested again in reading about Vedanta, which is really the highest expression of Indian spirituality. Vedanta, that is to say. And the Abnishas are the writings of Vedanta. The Abnishas are considered to be, in Indian philosophy and in Indian tradition, the New Testament of Hinduism. The Old Testament are the Vedas. But once again, the Vedas are concerned more with ritual and ceremonies you know, for nature, okay? for natural purposes. But in the Abnishas and Vedanta, this new revelation... Uh, concerns more with inner knowledge, that is to say, knowledge of the true self. Who are we? Who are we re really um, uh, beyond the body, beyond the mind, beyond our emotions, and beyond the material world as a whole? What is it that is really real? Uh, the part of us that is, you know, that exists uh, permanently, eternally, that never changes again. All of that is being uh, conveyed in the Abnishas, and so those revelations are considered to be a higher expression of Hinduism, the New Testament, the New Revelation, the New Dispensation. Now, what is exactly in the Abnishas? Again, what exactly are the Vedantis, in this case, the enlightened gurus and masters, that are, the hermits that are uh, contemplating and meditating in the forest, what exactly are they revealing uh, to India and to humanity at, at large? Well, first of all, the first principle of Vedanta is that this physical, material world, the world of nature, is an illusion. It's called Maya. Okay, it's an illusion. It's really the energy projection of the supreme being, the supreme soul, that is to say. So, this whole world, despite the fact that it appears very real, very solid, and we can experience sensations, and, you know, of pain and pleasure, etc., in reality, those are just momentary, temporary experiences of the soul, that is to say, that ultimately, this whole world is just a mirage, is really an illusion. Okay, it's like a dream, in other words. Okay, so first and foremost, the world is being revealed as an illusion. Okay, not that it doesn't exist, uh, it, it, it does, you know, to a certain degree, uh, but it's not permanent. It, it, it is it, ever changing and it's changing forms and is going to dissolve ultimately at one point and be reabsorbed back into the supreme self. Okay. 
So what is really reality then? What is this supreme self that is having this dream? Uh, what is that reality that is permanent and never changes, you know, that is eternal? Well, uh, in Vedanta, that reality is called Brahman. Okay? So, uh, this is very important to know that Brahman is not really a god out there, outside of ourselves. Like, you know, in other religions, you know, there's a picture of gods living in the sky and so on. No, Brahman is really the universal uh, spirit. Uh, that binds everything in creation. Okay, it's eternal, is universal, is beyond time and space, and that is what is called reality, and it's a divine reality. That is to say, okay. So, very important: the world, the material world, is an illusion, and Brahman, the universal spirit, is really what is really real, and that is the one that is creating the illusion, is creating Maya, and is at the same time inside of Maya, dreaming about it at the same time. Okay, so this is very important. And Brahman and Maya are actually just one single entity, they're not separated. It's not like the material world is here, and Brahman, the supreme being, is in another world, but rather everything is just one. Is just one single entity, that is to say. Okay. Now, furthermore, in Vedanta, uh, the gurus and the enlightened masters here uh, describe the nature of Brahman. How can we really describe Brahman? What is Brahman? We already said that. Well, it is the one, the one divine reality. It's true. But what are the characteristics? How can we describe it? The attributes of Brahman. And for this, uh, the Vedantists uh, provide three main attributes or aspects that are uh, intrinsic to Brahman. It's called Sat Chit Ananda. Okay, Sat Chit Ananda. Okay, so wh what does that mean? Okay, so Sat, what means is that Brahman is existent itself, okay? So it's pure existence, okay? So Brahman, first of all, again, this divine reality is just the ground of being, the ground of existence, existence itself. That's what's called Sat, okay? Chit is called consciousness, is that Brahman is also consciousness as well, is aware, is awareness. Pure consciousness, pure awareness. So it is existence, is aware of everything at once. So it's cosmic consciousness, is aware of the entire creation and everything within it. It's just pure, pure consciousness. In other terminology, this can be termed as omniscience as well, you know, all knowing, all knowledge, all intelligence. But it's, again, it's consciousness as well, you know, consciousness, chit. Um, and Ananda. What Ananda means is bliss, is that also the nature of Brahman is that it's just pure bliss as well. So existence, consciousness, bliss. Okay. So someone that has attained the, uh, the realization of Brahman is one that is aware that it exists eternally, is fully conscious at all times, it's just pure consciousness. And also is is a blissful state as well. Okay, and that is really the state of illumination or enlightenment. Again, for in the school of Vedanta. Now, what that means is that the individual soul. We talked about the individual soul in session two, Atman. You know, the individual soul that is engaged in this process of reincarnation and so on. Well. Uh, according to the Vedanta, the individual soul, Atman, and Brahman, the oversoul, the universal spirit, are one and the same. Okay? There's no separation between the individual soul and also the universal soul as well. Okay? They're actually one and the same. Uh, we can actually think of this as every individual soul is actually Brahman, an extension of Brahman that is actually experiencing its own self from different points of views. Okay, so every soul is really the universal consciousness expressed individually in order to see itself from a very unique perspective, in other words. So we're all watching the universe, which is Brahman, okay, 
uh, and the universe can be seen as watching itself from many different points of views. Okay, and so this is a you know the revelation of Vedanta. Now, that's another again of the principles of Vedanta, the unity of Brahman and Atman. Now, what then is the purpose of Atman? What is the purpose of the individual soul? What is the purpose, in other words, of human existence? Why are we here? And the reason why we're here is to realize the supreme ultimate truth that we are Brahman. In other words, that we, the individual soul, is actually the cosmic soul, in other words. Okay? And for this, we are experiencing the world of illusion, maya, over and over again. You know, the cycle of samsara, you know, the, the wheel of reincarnations. We're coming into the world, we're born again and again in order to have the necessary experiences for us to wake up and realize the ultimate truth. In other words, that is the, prop, the, uh, the purpose of human existence. Um, that is the ultimate purpose, of course, of human existence. This is called moksha. Moksha means liberation from samsara. You know, liberation from, from samsara. To be liberated, in other words, from the wheel of reincarnation. That, you know, we have to uh, wake up from the dream. And there are, of course, certain uh, practices, of course, certain disciplines that the Vedantists actually propose uh, for human beings to actually accelerate or speed up their process of awakening. Now, again, and this is where it gets also... Uh, to a certain degree controversial for the teachings of Hinduism at that time because if you recall Hinduism had clearly established that in order for people to attain perfection one is with the divine in other words that people needed to be born uh, through a series of reincarnations um, throughout the caste system across the caste system from the lowest caste, the Shudras, and then being born there for a while, you know, and incarnating there in many lifetimes, accumulating good karma, and then after accumulating good karma, we could indeed aspire to incarnate in a future life in a higher caste, again, until we reach the divine, in other words. So, uh, the conventional uh, teachings of Hinduism is that people needed to behave very well according to their caste, in order to attain good merits or good karma, in order to advance again in this spiritual journey to enlightenment. But here, the Vedantists are pretty much, you know, uh, discarding that, that idea. Uh, one of the reasons is that a great many of the disciples, a great many of the followers, and even the, the mystics themselves, the forest hermits, are not really Brahmins. They're not coming from the priestly caste. They're coming from all the castes. So they, they realize that you don't have to be a priest in order to contact the divine. You know, they're coming from merchants, from the sons, for example, of uh, artisans, from the sons of warriors, and so on. A great many of the Vedantists uh, are non priest and their families are non priest as well so they realize that this idea that we have to be reincarnating across the caste system uh, is not really again consistent with the new revelation of, of, of Hinduism this New Testament in other words that any person at any time no matter your caste no matter your background if you engage in the proper disciplines, you can indeed attain the supreme truth, which is Brahman. And the way to do this is not necessarily to be behaving well according to your caste. Of course, you have to uh, follow a certain moral code, behave appropriately, of course, but it has nothing to do with caste, in other words. Instead, what they propose is that, look, the way that we can actually speed up our spiritual awakening is by engaging in 
different kinds of disciplines and spiritual practices. For example, practice asceticism. Asceticism is a form of self-denial, in other words, that we have to detach ourselves from the world of illusion, maya. The world of illusion offer many pleasures and many sensations that can induce the mind to become more and more, if you will, uh, convinced that the material world is real, when in fact it's just an illusion. So, in order to liberate ourse ourselves from Maya, we have to practice asceticism. In other words, give up on you know indulging in certain activities, for example, like for example, you know, drinking alcohol, for example, um, you know, uh, engaging in illicit uh, sexual activities and relationships, etc. You know. Uh, denying, of course, you know, your body from participating in the world of pleasure, for example, and indulgence, for example. And little by little, the mind becomes freer and freer, more and more liberated from the shackles of maya. In other words, it's, again, that's called asceticism. Being in the forest kind of helped that because, you know, you're not going to be surrounded by the temptations of let's say the towns and the cities of India where people are indulging of course in the world. The other of course method is called sadhana. Sadhana is really spiritual discipline or spiritual practice. You know, the practice of meditation and contemplation, you know, closing the eyes, sitting down comfortably and uh, trying to withdraw the mind and the senses from the outer world. Remember this philosophy is directing human activity towards the inside, not the outside. So instead of being engaged in the world and participating in it, although it is important, uh, what is going to ultimately help liberation or moksha is people you know, withdrawing from the outer world, at least their attention from the outer world in order to direct their senses into the inner world so they can actually contact Brahman. In other words, Brahman is within ourselves, is inside ourselves. So again, this is not a God that people are, are, are trying to contact you know, in the outside, but rather within, in other words. Okay? That's called sadhana. Now, there will be, of course, a writing that really put together all of the teachings of Vedanta. And this is perhaps the highest expression of Vedanta as well. If the Apnishas are the highest expression of Indian spirituality, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, this book, uh, is the highest expression of Vedanta. Okay, And this is one of the books of the Mahabharata, the epic poems, again, of ancient India, that was written during the India's classical age. It was just one chapter of that book, actually, that deals with a battle. The battle between the two clans that divided themselves, you know, the good clan versus the evil clan that were, you know, disputing... Uh, land tenure and territories and inheritance, etc. And in this battle, according to the Bhagavad Gita, which by the way translates as the Song of the Lord, again, the Song of the Lord, this is the, you know, the poem, the Song of Lord Krishna. Uh, Lord Krishna, uh, according to Vedanta in Hinduism, was uh, an avatar of the god Vishnu who incarnated uh, in the world in order to uh, give the highest teachings to humanity and also to participate in this battle in the forces of goodness as well. So uh, it was in the midst of this battle that Krishna, this god, is actually the uh, charioteer of the one of the sons of the good clan, the Pandavas. Uh, it's, again, it's a series of brothers, five brothers that are actually fighting the evil clan, in other words. Um, and the, the, one of the sons of the Pandavas, Arjuna, as he's about to enter the battlefield, he becomes really frightened and weak and he's full of doubt because he's about to engage in a fratricidial uh, war in which he's about to wage war against many of his relatives and family members on the other side. 
you know, that have been consumed by greed and rage and anger, for example. So he doesn't want to kill them, in other words. He really doesn't want to participate in the carnage. And it is here, in this very crucial moment, before the war began, that Lord Krishna is now imparting to Arjuna the ultimate truth, the highest teachings of Vedanta, the highest teachings of India are given again in this poem or song. Uh, it really talks about the immortality of the soul. You know, that the soul is immortal, that the soul can never be killed, it was never born, it will never die, it has always been. The body dies, but the soul is eternal. In other words, the, there is a presence or essence within the human being that always has existed in eternity, that is to say. And he talks about the world as illusion as well, that the world is maya. But nonetheless, we are here to attain liberation and enlightenment. And as such, uh, whenever there, there's a crisis in the world, for example, this crisis that he, Arjuna was facing, it is the duty of the people of good conscience, again, of a higher consciousness, in other words, to actually stop evil, in other words, that it was his dharma, it was his duty to engage in the fighting, because ultimately um, uh, he's going to be uh, protecting the ultimate truth uh, by doing this. That yes, you know, there will be a lot of soldiers and a lot of people that are going to be killed in this process, but ultimately the death that we're witnessing and experiencing in this world is just an illusion because the soul is simply reincarnating over and over and over again. So uh, he really explains again that this this was his religious duty again, to, to uphold truth, to uphold virtue, to uphold the ultimate uh, realization of, you know, of Brahman in the world by battling the forces that were against it, in other words, okay? And in this book, he really outlines what is called the science of self-realization. How do we realize the self, Brahman, in other words? How do we wake up to this ultimate realization, to this ultimate truth? And he outlines the different kinds of yogic disciplines, there's different kinds of yogas. He explains very well how we, you know, a person can actually practice different f disciplines according to the kind of work that they conduct. Because you know, we we do have different uh, talents and gifts. We have different areas of work and occupation, and so there are different kinds of yogas for different kinds of work. So again, this is a very thorough presentation. Uh, about what is the soul, what is the purpose of human existence, uh, what is the religious duty, in this case, of people that are trying to uphold the truth, and what are the different disciplines and practices, yogic practices, by which one can attain the ultimate truth as well. Again, so uh, this is again a picture, and it shows Krishna, of course, uh, imparting that truth to Arjuna, uh, the, uh, the 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 warrior, the soldier that is commanding uh, the good clan, the, the Pandavas. Okay, so it's really uh, you know uh, the highest, like I said, expression of spiritual wisdom uh, in India. The Bhagavad Gita. I highly recommend that if you have the time to read it. It's not really that abstract uh, or complicated to understand. It's very simple, as a matter of fact, but very very profound. Now. Uh, during the Indus classical age, uh, we're also going to look at uh, other uh, schools uh, that are arising, for example, yoga. Now, yoga is very ancient. Uh, it goes way beyond you know, the arrival of uh, the Aryans back in time. You know, uh, yoga, uh, as we showed in session one, there, you know, was practiced during the Indus Valley River Civilization. I show you a, a, a clay tablet again, uh, a yogi again sitting in this position. So again, yoga has been practiced for literally thousands and thousands of years in the India subcontinent, but we're going to see a revival of yoga. And this is not to say that yoga had experienced uh, a downfall or... Um, a disappearance, 
by any means. There were still, you know, a lot of schools of yoga uh, across India. But there's going to be now a widespread interest now in the India subcontinent about yoga during this time. And we're going to see a number of different yogic schools and each school had a different method for, once again, withdrawing the senses and trying to direct the mind inwards in order for the mind to experience unity. In other words, the unity of all things, which is Brahman, in other words. So there were so many different schools. And during this time, there's going to be a mystic by the name of Patanjali, who was born in the 4th century, who is credited for synthesizing all of all the schools of yoga into one single coherent system. So according to uh, the classical schools of yoga, Patanjali is considered to be like the father of yoga in India, although, as I said, yoga had existed for thousands of years before him, of course, but he really made it accessible to most people. He synthesized it in a way that it was understandable and it's going to be understandable not only for the advanced disciples or aspirants, uh, but rather for even the newcomers, you know, the people that were barely becoming interested, again, in uh, in this discipline, it will become very easily accessible. And uh, he's going to write, of course, a book uh, that today is called The Eight Limbs of Yoga. Uh, it was really a synthesis of all the yogic practices, and he pretty much synthesized all yogic practices into a system that has like eight limbs or eight steps. You know, eight steps. Uh, they're called the Yoga Sutras of uh, Patanjali. And it's not really a book written like a narrative with an explanation, but rather those are aphorisms, like, you know, wise sayings, if you will, or proverbs. Um, each one carries profound meanings, again, in, in, into the mind and how a person can actually begin to uh, cultivate, for example, uh, moral virtue, positive attitudes, for example, uh, how a person can actually uh, learn how to uh, direct the physical body appropriately, the right posture, for example, postures or asanas as they're called, in order for the inner energy to move, you know, straight and so on. You know, how to control the breath. Controlling the breath is one way to controlling the mind and controlling the senses, controlling the emotions as well. Breathing exercises, uh, withdrawing from senses, as again, it's another discipline. How do we draw from the objects of sense whenever we're lured, again, to actually uh, engage in uh, sense gratification? Well, there is a discipline, you know, of how to actually withdraw from the senses as well how to start actually concentrating on one single thing at a time, how to train the mind to concentrate, how to meditate, in other words, how to prolong the concentration in one single spot or one thing, and also how to become totally absorbed with the Supreme Self to attain enlightenment. Again, those are the eight limbs of yoga. So he's really considered the father of yoga in India, just because he was able to put together all the different schools, the disciplines into one single system, the eight limbs, as they're called. Okay. All right. So there's going to be a widespread interest once again in philosophical inquiry, in meditation, you know, yoga practices and the like. You know, there is a new orientation in India in people trying to seek, of course, uh, an inner experience as opposed to an outer experience. And this is going to lead to two more philosophical schools or movements that are going to become very, very widespread, not only within India, but even outside of India as well. One of them will be Jainism, for example. Jainism was a, a spiritual movement uh, or philosophical movement that got started by Mahavira. Mahavira was actually 
a prince. He was an aristocrat, actually. He was born uh, from a very wealthy family in India in the 5th century BC. But by the age of 30, he became r very discontent with the lifestyle and with the comforts that surrounded him were not really providing any fulfillment in his life. So he pretty much stepped down and abandoned his family and his wealth. He renounced and he became a hermit. He went into the forest and the mountains and traveled and gathered a lot of students around him. And he's going to be f uh, the founder of Jainism, which was really uh, another spiritual school that attracted a great number of people, although not as many as, let's say, Vedanta, or let it just say, as we'll see, Buddhism. But nonetheless, it did uh, attracted a great number of people into its ranks. Uh, the revelation of Mahavira as he attained illumination or enlightenment in the forest is that in order for people to attain enlightenment, it was essential for people to practice what is called ahimsa. Ahimsa is nonviolence. And nonviolence means nonviolence to all living beings, not only to our fellow human beings, but also to animals as well, including insects, including plants as well. Okay, nonviolence. That this was essential for the soul to not only cultivate moral virtue, but to really bring out the most noble aspects of the soul as well, you know, for, the, for this blissful nature of ourselves to wake up, in other words, to practice nonviolence. That includes not even killing insects, flies or ants, and, you know, the, the Jains, you know, uh, actually uh, cover their mouths. They wore a mask in many cases, to avoid breeding insects. And that whenever they will walk through the forest, they will actually carry a brush, for example, or a stick in order to remove any insect from their path uh, for, you know, to avoid injury or killing them in this case because they believe that every living creature, every living being contains what is called a soul. Okay, Not only human beings have a soul, but also animals have a soul. Um, and also insects and plants have a soul as well. Everything that is alive has its own soul as well. Okay, they're part of Brahman, in other words. They're aware, you know, they, they are. Uh, different degrees of awareness, but they are aware, so they have that life principle, you know, the sat chit ananda, in other words, and Brahman in, inside of them. Uh, the life principle. So, you know, they practice strict vegetarianism in this case, and in many cases, uh, they only ate the part of the plant that could be obtained from the plant, like a fruit, for example, or some grains that d will not require actually killing the plant as a whole. In other words, the kind of vegetables or fruits that they ate were simply collected from the plants or from the trees, and they will not engage in the killing of the tree or the plant in order to consume it. In other words, you know, strict, strict. Uh, non-violence practices. Okay, they practice also non-attachment, you know, not to become attached to the world, to sensations, practice truthfulness, for example, and chastity as well. You know, they were celibate in many cases. They will not get married, uh, they will travel together, and they will not engage in any kind of uh, sexual, you know, uh, activity whatsoever. They also practice, again, extreme asceticism, self-denial, uh, in many cases, their practices were a little bit extreme, you know, uh, denying the body from any kind of pleasure. They actually regarded the body as uh, a, a tool, in many cases, a tool of the soul, but really not important whatsoever. You know, they will not care to dress it, you know, eh, 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 you know eh, elegantly or anything like that. In fact, a great many Jains actually walk uh, almost bare naked. You know, almost just uh, uh, wearing just a line cloth, you know, uh, you know, very austere, uh, very, very simple. 
And in many cases, they ate also very little food as well. They were not really that concerned with pleasing the body or adorning the body for that matter. Okay, extreme asceticism. So it was very difficult to practice Jainism just because the practices were extremely difficult. So they're not going to attract a massive following, let us just say, although it will become a very popular movement in India and very respected movement in India. The philosophical school that actually became extremely popular in India and that attracted millions and millions of people, not only within the Indian subcontinent, but even abroad, across Asia, will be Buddhism. Now, Buddha shared so many similarities with Mahavira in that both were really princes. You know, uh, Buddha started out, again, his life, he was born a prince, his name was Gautama Siddhartha. Uh, he was born in North India, in what today uh, constitutes the country, the modern day country of Nepal, in a kingdom there. Uh, so uh, he was born from a uh, wealthy, of course, king, and the father wanted uh, Siddhartha uh, to be the next heir to the throne, of course. So he endeavored to really trained Siddhartha in the arts of warfare. You know, he was a Kshatriya, a warrior from the warrior caste, and he wanted Siddhartha to be a warrior king, to inherit the throne of this uh, uh, warrior kingdom. Uh, of course, when he was born, uh, one of the holy men uh, that saw Siddhartha as a baby actually told the king that uh, this baby was destined to be a conqueror but not a conqueror of kingdoms, but a conqueror of souls. In other words, he was, going to he was destined to become a holy man, in other words, and a very, very enlightened being as well. And so ever since that time, uh, his father became very concerned that the heir to the throne was going to become a saint and not a warrior. He didn't want that. So he tried to isolate uh, Siddhartha um, from all human suffering. He didn't want Siddhartha to really know what was really going on in the world. He didn't want Siddhartha to awaken that noble part of his soul to become concerned with human suffering, etc. So he indulged Siddhartha in, in every possible way and gave him the best foods, you know, the best parties, you know. Uh, entertainment and the like, you know. So he will experience constant pleasure and happiness inside of the kingdom. So he'll become the next king. So he'll become attached, in other words, to pleasure. And so he will never leave the kingdom, in other words. And so he actually removed all of the people that suffered within the kingdom and he moved them outside of the the walls of the kingdom. He actually built a small town or a small city in order to remove all the people that were sick, uh, the people that were, for example, very old, uh, people that suffer from illnesses, you know, uh, disease, etc. All of the people that were suffering uh, were removed from the kingdom and they were sent to another place, you know. So he was really isolated. We, we can we can actually look at it this way, okay? Totally isolated from human suffering. Now, it is precisely during this time in his kingdom that Siddhartha is going to um, come in contact with Hinduism. There were Hindu priests in the kingdom that were trying to get Siddhartha to participate in the Vedic rites and animal sacrifice. And he really didn't understand, you know, why is it that certain animal sacrifices needed to be performed. He was actually invited at one point to actually partake in the sacrifice, to actually sacrifice a bull in this case, and he couldn't do it. He felt compassion for this being, you know, for the, for the bull. And he said, you know, why is it that we have to sacrifice this innocent creature, for example? You know, I don't understand what, what, what is the purpose of this ritual. In other words, you know, why is it that we have to confer uh, an offering to the gods by sacrificing an animal, for example? So, you know, he really came at odds with the priests of the kingdom. 
So it is precisely because of his discontent with Hinduism and also because he, at one point he was so curious as to what was really happening outside of the kingdom that one, one time he asked one of the guards to take him to a ride to go take a ride you know, outside. So he was taken into the uh, different areas of the kingdom and he visited you know, that city that contained all of those people that were sick and that were... You know, that had suffered accidents, etc., the elderly. And he asked, you know, what's wrong with those people? And the guard says, you know, well, that's just being human. You know, we humans, we grow old, we become older, you know, and we die. We suffer from sickness, we suffer from disease, you know, and, you know, there's suffering in the world. I mean, this is just what humans, all humans are going through. You know, why is it, he said, then that I have not ever seen this is well because your father had actually isolated you from the world in other words but this is the reality in other words so he was so heart stricken you know that he couldn't really bear the burden of pain and suffering from seeing other human beings actually in those states and he wondered why is it that they're suffering in the world so he couldn't really understand that and he was tormented by that by that idea and eventually at one point he decided to leave the kingdom altogether he is now in search for enlightenment he left the kingdom he renounced his title he renounced the throne you know uh, of uh, the kingdom as well and he now became a mystic you know a hermit he going he's going into the mountains he's going into the forest in search for enlightenment um, and he practiced extreme asceticism, you know, he followed the prescriptions of Jainism, you know, uh, you know, almost punishing the body, starving the body, you know, to a certain degree, fasting, you know, and all of that. But after a while, you know, he learned that all of those practices were not really rendering any results. So one day he just sat, sat under a tree, the Bod Bodhi tree, you know, as it is called. And after 40 days of just closing his eyes and being in total absorption and meditation, he experienced enlightenment, of course. Okay. Of course, he had also some temptations, like three temptations, very similar to what you know Christ uh, underwent in the desert as well. Buddha is going through this process in the 5th century uh, BC before Christ as well. So he attained enlightenment. He attained, of course, the supreme truth. You know, uh, oneness with the divine, in other words, in a, you know, awakening, in other words. And that is really what the word Buddha means. Buddha means to be awake, the awakened one, in other words. Okay, uh, that's what the, the word Buddha means, the, the person that has awakened. So he assembled a group of disciples in, in, a, in, a, in, in a forest and he then imparted the truth of his enlightenment, the revelations, in other words, what he had learned from his enlightenment and his teachings are known as the Dharma. This is a new revelation, this is a new testament, once again, in the history of India, a new Dharma, a new revelation. Um, first and foremost, he's really rejecting the idea of caste, all right, you know, just outright, he's totally rejecting the idea that the caste system is consistent with uh, with spirituality. You know, there's no spiritual wisdom or truth behind organizing people in that fashion. In other words, so he rejects uh, totally that social organization. But what he's actually revealing here in his four noble truths is that first and foremost, life is suffering. Now we are indeed in the world of illusion. And because we are totally unaware that the world is illusion, that therefore we experience suffering. That is to say, so again, so that is inescapable. As long as we are asleep in the world, we will continue to experience suffering. The cause of suffering, that's the second noble truth, is that suffering comes from craving or desire. In other words, attachment to the world of illusion. When we take the world to be real, we become attached to it, we crave it, we desire it, desire it, and that desire creates suffering. Because in many cases, again, our desires cannot be fulfilled. 
in other words. So that creates anxiety, that creates suffering, in other words. Suffering, number three, ends with the cessation of desire. How do we end suffering? Well, we have to give up on craving and desire. In other words, self-denial, in other words, to deny ourselves from the temptations and the cravings of the world so we can attain a, a, a peaceful mind, in other words, you know, so our mind can become peaceful, detached from the senses, from the world of illusion, and we can experience serenity, in other words, inner peace. And the way to accomplish this, the, uh, the other noble truth, is by following the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path, again, is the method by which we can end suffering. What is the method? Well, a right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Again, by following those eight uh, steps, again, we can actually end suffering and indeed attain the supreme truth. Okay? He's also, again, advising to take the middle path. In other words, you don't need those extreme practices of Jainism. Okay? That's one extreme, you know, the extreme asceticism, nor you need to follow the other extreme of the outward, rigid ceremonialism of Hinduism. Okay? You don't need that. You just follow a middle path, a more moderate path. Just follow the Eightfold Path in a moderate way. Be moderate in everything. Moderate in everything. Moderation, in other words. Even in, you know, in the spiritual disciplines. Don't punish the body, in other words. Okay? By doing that, we attain the ultimate truth. Liberation, moksha, or nirvana. Nirvana, moksha, liberation is the same thing. Liberation from the world of illusion, and we attain the ultimate state, again, of unity. Okay? He also advised for uh, as people coming together and forming spiritual communities, the Sangha, for example. This is very important, a community of Buddhist, mo Buddhist monks that are going to be helping each other attain nirvana or moksha. And uh, over time, after the death of uh, Buddha, Buddhism, of course, is going to split into two sects. You know, the Theravada sect and the Mahayana sect. And Buddhism did not stay as a single block. Again, it actually splintered into two different, you know, movements. Theravada, of course, is the movement. It's called uh, the little vehicle in this case. Uh, this is practiced by the mystics. You know, they say Buddha was not really a god. Uh, uh, he was just an enlightened being and he's just showing us how to attain that enlightened state by practicing meditation, in other words. So this is just for a handful of people to do, in other words, the Theravada path. The Mahayana is the big vehicle and the big vehicle is the more popular form of Buddhism in which people are engaging in the worship of the Buddha. Buddha is considered to be a divine being and all the people that attain the state of Buddha as well uh, are considered to be also divine beings. And they're like the saints, for example, like saints and virgins in their rituals and ceremonies. And this is more for the masses. Again, it's a more popular form of Buddhism. Okay. Now, Buddhism in perspective, again, is that Buddhism introduced uh, uh, the idea that enlightenment is really the ultimate purpose of human existence. And one attains that by self-denial, by, once again, renouncing to the trappings, the cravings, the desires of the world. It was also a challenge to, to the caste system because he did not agree that only the Brahmins, the priests, could aspire to attain enlightenment. That anybody, even a Shudra, a worker, a peasant, a merchant, an artisan, a warrior, anybody could practice, again, self-denial and attain enlightenment. So Buddha is really credited for introducing the idea of universal equality, that all humans are really equal, that we are indeed part of the same divine reality. In other words, that all those castes, you know, positioning people from top to bottom, you know, ranking them into a social system, 
that that's really an artificial way of organizing society, that we're all equal. So this is very important. Again, the principle of universal equality is introduced very early on by Buddha. And the second, second person that will introduce that, you know, that concept will be, of course, Jesus as well. We're going to talk about that when we get to Christianity. Again, universal equality. Now, what we're going to be covering now in part four is India in the age of empires. Now, we're going to cover three empires, uh, the Mauryan Empire, the Gupta, and the Mughal. Um, and they're going to serve a very, very important fu function uh, in Indian history. And uh, at least the Mauryan, for example, and the Gupta empires and trying to unify India, the different uh, parts of India that were independent. Uh, India was really broken up into a series of principalities or kingdoms. And we're going to see for the very first time in Indian history, uh, the attempt to centralize and unify all of those uh, fragments, so to speak, of the Indian subcontinent and providing at the same time uh, a certain sense of community or common cultural identity as well. So the empires are going to serve that functions, as we'll see. Uh, now, let's go over uh, those empires and see how they were formed and what role they played in creating um, the nation of India, so to speak. Uh, of course, you know, the nation of India doesn't exist at this time, but we're going to see, of course, more and more people coming together and forming uh, a common sense of identity, so to speak. Okay, We start with the Mauryan Empire. And the Mauryan Empire spanned between 325 all the way to 185 BC. And this is uh, the very first time in Indian history that we're going to see, once again, the attempt to unify all of the different kingdoms of India. And the architect, the forerunner of this empire was Chandragupta. Uh, he was uh, uh, the ruler of the Bhagatha Kingdom. Uh, along the Ganges River. Again, there's going to be a series of kingdoms that flourish there from 600 to 300 BC. Again, we're going to see a series of kingdoms there. And they're going to be warring kingdoms. They're going to be competing with one another. And it is precisely this kingdom led by Chandragupta. He's coming from the Mauryan dynasty. Okay, uh, Chandragupta is going to be the first one to unify uh, all of those kingdoms along the Ganges, but also the kingdoms that were settled along the Indus River Valley as well uh, into a single imperial order. Um, now, Chandragupta followed, of course, in this uh, attempt to unify all of those kingdoms together. He followed a policy. Uh, it was really a policy of conquest. Again, uh, it was called the policy of the scepter. Okay, and the policy of the scepter really was a policy uh, that uh, entailed waging war, for example, against the weaker neighbors, the weaker kingdoms of the region, try to bring them together, try to unify all the resources and centralize those economies, harness all of those resources to create a large army and use that army to confront the stronger kingdoms. And so the stronger kingdoms are going to be invited to join the alliance. And if they didn't want to join the alliance, of course, there will be outright warfare. And so this is the policy that he followed. It's called the policy of the scepter. Once again, trying to uh, wage war against the weaker kingdoms, also trying to build alliances. And in the process, trying to uh, create a larger and larger imperial army, so to speak, that will be used to march all across northern India and engage in this process of conquest. Again, the conquest of the Ganges and Indus River uh, Valley. While at the same time, the policy of the scepter also involved following a more compassionate, more humanitarian policy for the kingdom of Madatka as well. So again, it was a very aggressive foreign policy towards the outside and domestically just following a more benign, more benevolent uh, policies for the people living in the kingdom, ruling the empire. Again, so he was able to conquer uh, Northeast and Northwest India, and he's also going to 
conquer certain portions of the Middle East, uh, portions that had been conquered by Alexander the Great you know, in the past. Uh, Alexander the Great actually invaded, the Macedonian king invaded India from the north, Northwest, and some parts of the Northwest uh, uh, of the Indian subcontinent were ruled you know, by some generals of Alexander the Great. Well, he was able to seize even some of those lands, and so he was really expanding into the Middle East proper. Uh, so he is the architect, again, of the very first empires called the Maurya uh, Empire. Uh, and it will not be really his son, but his grandson that is going to actually expand the empire. And he will become one of the most renowned um, kings or monarchs in Indian history. You know, it was King Ashoka. King Ashoka the Great, who uh, came to power in the year 272 B.C., uh, he is going to really expand the empire, but at the, at the same time, he's going to really implement a new vision for the empire, a united vision, so to speak, for India, guided under the principles of Buddhism, as we'll see. So he was known uh, uh, throughout his reign as the philosopher king, uh, uh, King Ashoka, the philosopher king. Again, this is a statue uh, that today uh, displays King Ashoka. He's one of the most renowned uh, Indian kings uh, celebrated in India today. Okay, so Ashoka also followed the policy of the scepter. Initially, he is really pushing for a very aggressive foreign policy. He's conquering kingdoms to the south. And one of the kingdoms that offered resistance was the kingdom of Kalinga, uh, right here in the northeast, as you can see, this kingdom resisted Ashoka. And so there's going to be a major war uh, called the Kalinga War, in which Ashoka is really trying to uh, demolish the resistance. He sends hundreds of thousands of soldiers into the Kalinga territory, and there's a massive, massive battle. Uh, and it became a, one of the bloodiest battles of the ancient world. You know, there were hundreds of thousands of people dead at the end of the day. And the significance of the Kalinga War is that this war is going to mark uh, Ashoka's psyche forever because he was able to witness the destruction, the carnage, for example, the suffering of the people that were hundreds of thousands of people dead, but also hundreds of thousands of people that were displaced, women and children, the elderly. Again, it was a lot of suffering and he couldn't bear all of the suffering. And, you know, it affected him uh, greatly to the point that when he comes back to his, to his kingdom, um, he was undergoing a change of heart, so to speak, and he converted to uh, Buddhism, the religion of Buddhism, the religion of compassion. And he's going to adopt Buddhism as the state religion of the entire empire. Okay, not only the kingdom, but the entire empire. He's going to declare that this is really the new religion. And again, his idea was to create a new vision, again, for uh, an ideal world. This is the very first time that a monarch in human history period is really trying to create uh, an ideal society, an ideal kingdom. It was really beyond just the practical use of religion to create a common identity, he really wanted to care for his people, in other words, okay? He really wanted to create an ideal, humanitarian, compassionate world, a compassionate society. And so he adopted the, Bo the Buddhist teachings, the Dharma, as they were called, as the law of the empire, okay? So those are not secular laws, those are religious laws that are going to guide the empire from this point onwards. Again, so this is a really, again, it's something also very, very new in human history. This is the significance of Ashoka, again, uh, for world civilization, so to speak, not only for Indian civilization. And so he's going to actually write down all of those laws in pillars, rock pillars, and he plays those pillars in the different kingdoms that he conquered for people to read them and know what is really the law of the land. And again, those are really just philosophical, religious uh, principles, religious teachings of the Buddha uh, that are supposed to be the moral guide for people's behavior, people's behavior towards one another, but also people's behavior towards the state as well. They were known as the uh, rock edicts or the edicts, the rock edicts. 
again, and they were placed in different uh, areas of the empire. Um, and so uh, what those rock edicts uh, indicated, first and foremost, is that he's really making clear that one of the principles, again, uh, uh, of the empire is the principles of ahimsa, nonviolence or social justice for that matter, the abolition of animal slaughter, for example, uh, taking care uh, not only uh, of uh, other human beings like the elderly, for example, the, 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 the sick, trying to provide medicine for them, trying to take care of the poor, uh, trying to create more hospitals and so on. Uh, what is called social justice, but also taking care of animals as well. Uh, he abolished all forms of animal slaughter, again, particularly the cow. You know, he, he's going to advocate for a more vegetarian uh, diet. Uh, vegetarianism is on the rise, you know, and this is the time when India is cultivating now a vegetarian diet and the cow becomes now sacred. Again, it was becoming pervasive all over India. So again, Buddhism had a great deal uh, to do with stopping, again, the, uh, the slaughters, again, of animals through the edicts of Ashoka. He's also going to sponsor the construction of Buddhist temples and monasteries across the empire. He commissioned uh, thousands of engineers, again, to build monasteries, temples, and also stupas. About 84,000 stupas, or burial mounds, where the ashes of the Buddha were going to be disseminated and distributed all across India, uh, for people to go and visit those mounds uh, as a sac as sacred sites, as sites for pilgrimages, for example, places of pilgrimage. Okay, so those are the stupas that he ordered, the construction of those stupas again. And so it, India is really taking uh, a, a unique you know, characteristic during this time of Ashoka is more Buddhist than Hindu. Uh, Hinduism is you know, not really disappearing from India, but is really in the background, you know, throughout this time. Um, uh, monasteries are built, uh, such as this one, for example, and temples. Um, and this is, again, sponsored by King Ashoka. Okay, this is another of those temples. It says Buddhism is now, you know, becoming more and more mainstream across India. He also sponsored uh, missions. He sent mi missionaries, Buddhist missionaries, across India and even outside of India, you know, uh, moving into the Middle East, all the way to places like, for example, Egypt, you know, the Greek world as well, um, and also to the north, you know, Tibet is also going to receive Buddhist monks, and also Southeast Asia, places like, for example, China, uh, uh, Thailand, for example, uh, what is called Indonesia, for example, is also going to receive uh, uh, Buddhist monks, and Buddhism is going to spread to different areas of the world. So Ashoka really was a major promoter of Buddhism uh, throughout Asia and the Middle East. This is a time when Buddhism becomes mainstream in India and a unifying force as well. However, uh, with Ashoka's death, uh, the empire disintegrated. There's going to be a lot of wars of secession. Uh, the empire begins to crumble rather quickly, uh, it, mainly in 18, uh, uh, 184 BC. W the, one of the last heirs of the Myron dynasty is actually assassinated, and the whole empire now is fragmented. And it was very difficult to keep it together due to the fracture geography and, of course, the local and regional revolts that ensued after the fall of the Mauryan dynasty made it very difficult to keep it together because of the fracture, dynasty, uh, fracture geography. Now, the other empire is the Gupta Empire, and the Gupta Empire also flourished along the Ganges River, and it was an attempt to re rekindle, revive the Mauryan Empire. Uh, this happened in 320 AD, and it didn't last very long. Again, it's going to actually, you know, uh, come to an end by uh, 540 AD. Now, this empire was weaker. It was not really centralized. It really was a system that created a like, system of alliances, so to speak, in which all the monarchies needed to simply pay tribute to the emperor, uh, and they kept a kind of stable system throughout this process. So it was not 
all that centralized. It was not all that aggressive, so to speak. Uh, now, uh, the significance, of course, of the Gupta Empire is that Hinduism is going to make a comeback because the Guptas adopt Hinduism as the state religion. They were trying to create also a common identity across India, so they adopt Hinduism and they provide systems of education in order to educate uh, the new generations under the principles of Hinduism. And by doing that, you know, a common identity is forged in the process. They're also going to sponsor the uh, 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 creation of Hindu temples across the empire as well. And along the Ganges, we're going to see uh, a surge of Hindu temples, and they're going to serve as magnets to attract pilgrims from all over India. You know, there will be people now flocking to the Ganges River, not only to attend the temples, but also to take a sacred bath, you know, in the Ganges River. And again, there's going to be annual pilgrimages where people from all over India, coming from many different backgrounds, ethnic, linguistic, religious backgrounds of every kind, are going to converge in the Ganges River, and we're going to see the formation of a Hindu identity, so to speak, during the Gupta time. So again, Hinduism is really making a comeback. We see the resurgence of Hinduism, and Buddhism is on a decline uh, during this time. You know, now the Hindu priests, the Brahmins, or the Brahmanas, are uh, on a, uh, 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 rising up to the top once again. They're acquiring significant power at a local level. They're even becoming very wealthy landowners. And of course, the consequence of this is that the caste system consolidates during the Gupta Empire, the caste system. Now, the last empire, the Mughal Empire, that spanned from 1526 to 1761, uh, it's going to be a foreign-led uh, empire. Again, this is not really arising from within the Indian subcontinent. Those are foreign groups that are arrived from the Middle East. And there are Muslims. And they're going to create an empire, a Muslim empire in India. Now, the background of the, uh, of the Mughal, again, uh, uh, empire goes back to the Muslim invasions uh, into India from the Northwest. You know, there's, of course, Arabs invading India in 712 AD and they installed themselves in a section you can see in this map for a while they ruled Northwest India for a period of time after the Arabs comes the Turks also from the Middle East they raid India in the year 1001 but finally in the year 3 uh, 1320 they're able to conquer most of India and they rule uh, most of India until the end of that century, until 1399, thereabouts. Again, the beginning of the 1400s, the Turks rule over India. And they bring, of course, the Muslim faith. During this process, of course, there's a major disruption of local economies and kingdoms in India, the dislocation of population, there's famine, of course, and also the destruction of Hindu temples. So the Hinduism really suffers a sort of setback during this time uh, due to the fact that you know the 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 Turks, you know, are bringing a, a total new faith, and there's going to be religious conflict, of course. Now, the Mughals is a new group, is a blend of Mongol and Turkish peoples that invade India in 1526. They're able to install a uh, an empire in India, and um, we see, of course, the reintroduction of Islam once again in India, and from this time onwards. India is going to develop now more uh, stable connections with the Islamic world. Okay, There's now connections between the Vedic and the Islamic civilizations during the Mughal time. Uh, we see that, for example, in the art, the Islamic art and architecture is on the rise now. Uh, in India, for example, the Taj Mahal that was built in 1648 is one of those expressions, again, that the Mughal emperors were building a burial uh, palaces again like the Taj Mahal for the royal family for example and during the Mughal years of course um, we see of course certain rulers like Akbar the tolerant respecting Hinduism in order to centralize authority he believed that you know it was essential uh, in order to maintain order and stability in India uh, as a foreign power that they needed to respect the local traditions the local religion uh, in order to really centralize authority, in other words. But his successor, 
um, Arungatseb, the intolerant who ruled from 1658 to 17, 1707, uh, reversed that policy and he became very intolerant against Hindu uh, leaders because he believed that Islam in India was becoming more and more uh, uh, what he termed, quote unquote, polluted. In other words, by uh, the Hindu practices, in other words, there was a certain hybrid on the rise. Islam was taking a lot of the Hindu characteristics again. So he really antagonized the local leaders, the caste leaders, the priests, and that was really the downfall of the Mughal Empire because obviously the, Bra the Brahmanas, of course, the priests, along the caste leaders, are going to rally the masses across the empire against uh, the Mughals, and this caused the downfall again, of the Mughal Empire. All right, so in sum, what we have covered uh, in this topic is that Indian civilization, first and foremost, we can see that it was really a hybrid, so to speak, between the Dravidian culture and the Aryan cultures. You know, the Dravidian goes back to the Indus River Valley civilization that we covered at the very beginning, and the Aryans are the Indo-Europeans that arrived. And again, we see a blend of elements, so to speak, between those two. Another very important characteristic of Indian civilization is the idea of caste, the social system of caste in which people are identified in India uh, based on kinship. You know, if you're born a Shudra, that is not only your caste, that is your extended family group. So every caste is really uh, uh, an extended family. So this is going to remain a very strong sense of identification in India. Another very important element of Indian civilization is religion and philosophy. Hinduism, Buddhism, for example, Jainism, Yoga, Vedanta, all the mystical schools, again, introduce the idea that, you know, reality is really a divine reality. That this world is Maya, is illusion, and the orientation of the entire culture is for people to get in contact with this divine reality through different kinds of practices and disciplines. Of course, this provides a, a cultural identity for people, and also it provides a, a tool for rulers to create both political legitimacy, in other words, to create a legitimate rule, you know, like Ashoka, for example, that endorsed Buddhism, you know, becomes really the religion of the state, or the Guptas that endorse Hinduism, it becomes the religion of the state, it serves to re legitimize the rulers as well, but it also, religion, like Hinduism in this case, serve to uh, counter the foreign powers again, for example, the Mughals, the resistance, for example, is served to rally the people and confront, again, the Mughals and overthrow them as well. So religion was a very powerful force in India for providing identity, political legitimacy, and also resistance, again, against foreign rule. And last but not least, the geography. Geography, again, in India had been extremely important, determining the size of the political states. In India, uh, the norm has been, again, that the states have been rather small political states. Although there have been empires in India, those empires didn't really last very long, precisely because of the broken geography. And also, the foreign invasions that were coming from the Northwest uh, led to cultural divisions in India in ways that the North uh, remained predominantly Aryan and also Islamic, the strong Aryan and Islamic elements in the north, and the south remained predominantly Dravidian. Again, uh, so uh, this is all I have for you. We have concluded this topic again on Indian uh, civilization. Uh, when we come back, we're going to begin with China. Um, we're going to start a whole new topic, the fifth topic on China. And we initiate that in session one when we come back. Thank you.